first speaker. So today's first speaker is Dr. Muhammad Ali Shah. He is a DABR Chief Medical Physicist at St. Luke's Hospital, Sedar, Finlay Hospital. Uh, his topic is about the basics of linear accelerator, basics of linear accelerators. So before I uh, convey uh, the speaker's dice to uh, Dr. Muhammad Ali Shah, I just like to mention that the the attendance link would be you can find the uh, attendance link in few minutes in the chat box so you can mark the attendances and uh, for certification i will describe the procedure after this lecture so dr mohammed alisha you can continue now thank you thank you so much uh, assalamu alaikum and hello everyone uh, i'm going to share my screen now and Okay, can you see my screen or oh, not yet? Uh, not yet. Not yet. Let me see. Okay, now. I think it's shared now. Yeah, it's shared. We can see now. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, hello everyone, my name is Muhammad Ali Shah and as Saad introduced me, uh, currently I'm Chief Medical Physicist in St. Luke's Hospital in Cedar Rapids and Finley Hospital in Dubuque, uh, Iowa State. Today I'm going to talk about basics of, of a linear accelerator uh, and for disclosure statement, uh, I declare that I do not have any financial relationship with proprietary entities producing marketing, reselling, or distributing healthcare goods or services consumed or used on patients in the past 24 months. So um, st starting the talk about a linear accelerator, um, they use high frequency electromagnetic waves to accelerate charged particles like electrons to very high energies. Um, the acceleration is performed in the linear tube. Um, th that's the whole concept as opposed to acceleration in circular orbits, uh, which will be a betatron. The first linear accelerator was built in 1928 in Germany and the longest linear accelerator is two miles long. So this accelerating duct used to be miles long in uh, when accelerators were discovered. But recently uh, due to the technology that, that we are going to discuss today, we just uh, accelerate the charged particles to very high energies in this short area. Uh, so from a medical physics point of view, accelerators can be discussed in two parts. One is the section that generates and accelerates radiation, uh, like we generate microwaves and then accelerate electrons with them. And the second section is the head part of the accelerator. So for those of you who are preparing for some kind of exams, uh, uh, sometime you will get exam questions from the head part as well. Uh, talking about different uh, position of different uh, uh, options that we are going to discuss. <clears throat> so uh, uh, in a block diagram uh, in accelerator, we have a modulator and um, then modulator uh, provides signal to electron gun and magnetron or klystron at the same time. And from magnetron or klystron, uh, we get a signal or pulse passed to the accelerating tube where the electrons are accelerated and then they are passed onto treatment head and then to the patient. And this is kind of a little fancy diagram of the same uh, stuff. So um, talking about um, first, as I said, uh, uh, we, we will divide it in two sections. One is the radiation producing section and then the uh, next will be beam delivery section. In the radiation producing section, the first part is modulator and in in modulator, thyrotron is one of the important parts. In this picture, this section is the modulator section of a linear accelerator. For those of you who have variant uh, accelerators, they may have seen this in the back of the accelerator, uh, this section, and then the klystron or magnetron sitting on top of our modulator section. So our journey begins when the direct current is provided to the modulator. Uh, modulator includes pulse forming network, and we are going to talk about them. And then a hydrogen thyrotron, it is filled with hydrogen tube. Uh, thyrotrons are basically switch tubes. 
and then uh, we they create flat top pulses of a few microsecond duration. Uh, in the pulse forming network, um, this is an important part of accelerator. It stores stores energy at, at a specific time and then discharges it to the output load. So there is a very um, high power capacitor uh, that has a lot of charge in it all the time. And you may have heard from the engineers that uh, if you are, uh, especially for physicists, uh, if you are working on the accelerator and uh, if you have to do something in the back part, don't touch the capacitor part of the accelerator because it, it can give a huge shock at any time. So the idea of this uh, storing the charge is to accumulate energy over a comparatively long time and then releasing the stored energy, the stored energy uh, for the relatively square pulses uh, of brief duration. And here uh, I have a block diagram. So from capacitance, uh, the signal goes to the fast uh, thyrotron switch and the thyrotron switch, uh, it gives the signal to pulse transformer. So all this section is the modulator. And then finally from modulator, the signal moves on to klystron or uh, magnetron. Thyrotron, as I discussed, is a switch. It acts as a switch. Um, they are gas filled electron tubes that are used as high voltage switches. Um, a thyrotron fires when a pulse of high voltage reaches a preset value. The pulse is discharged from the pulse forming network to the pulse transformer. So a thyrotron works, it has a cathode and anode and it has control rings, a uh, control grid in the center it can be a single control grid or multiple control grids. So when the grid is negatively charged uh, as compared to cathode, then it is repelling the electrons and it's not slowing down uh, the electrons. And when it is positively charged, it's accelerating the electrons. So when the electrons are accelerated, it is gas filled, they create an avalanche of charge and the charge kind of moves towards the a plate uh, or the anode and uh, th this way they act as a switch uh, by controlling the um, polarity of the uh, of the uh, con control grid thyrotrons are gas filled tubes hydrogen is used hence the uh, hence the name hydrogen thyrotron tubes um, other gases like xenon uh, neon and mercury vapors can also be used in thyrotrons but in accelerators mostly they are hydrogen thyrotrons then the pulse transformer signal goes from thyrotron to the pulse transformer. They can operate at high frequencies. Pulse transformers are capable of transforming more power as compared to normal transformers. And that's why we use them in accelerators. Um, and these can provide square wave output. Uh, and they can increase amplitude by a factor of 15.3. Uh, so once uh, the uh, signal moves to the pulse transformer. From here, the signal is delivered to magnetron or klystron, and simultaneously, at the same time, it is delivered to the electron gun. Again here, um, uh, um, as I told you, this is the klystron section where the, uh, the signal from the pulse transform, transform moves into the klystron. And here we are looking inside the modulator and inside the modulator, we have thyrotron, and um, you can see the capacitor that I talked about. Uh, uh, it's a, it is a, a high storage capacitor, and then the pulse transformer. So all these are kind of uh, stored in this section, and this is connected to the klystron, and also it sends a signal to the electron, electron gun. And once the signal is sent to, um, Klystron or magnetron, some accelerators have klystrons and some accelerators have magnetrons. Um, there is some uh, background noise. Um, uh, I think someone is not mute and... Uh... Uh, let me check. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, it's better now. So um, when the signal from modulator goes to either klystron or magnetrons, some accelerators have magnetrons and some have klystrons. Uh, mag magnetrons are usually used in low energy accelerators like 6 MV or, or something like that. And klystrons uh, are used in accelerators that have uh, high energies. Um, 
first we are going to look at magnetrons. Magnetrons um, have magnets uh, uh, that, that have a magnetic field. And then in the center, uh, we have anode uh, on the boundaries and a cathode in the center. So when electrons are generated by, by the cathode, they, uh, by the anode, uh, sorry, <laughs> electrons are generated by the cathode, they accelerate towards the anode. And at the same time, the magnetic field kind of spirals them. So, so instead of moving straight, running straight towards the anode, they are moving in spirals. And when they are moving in spirals, they are creating uh, an electromagnetic wave, microwaves. And those microwaves are collected in these cavities. Uh, and in these cavities, we have the uh, connection to the output. So, uh, so when the microwaves are, uh, gets collected in these cavities, with the, with the help of these connections, they are moved to output antenna and into the uh, um, gantry or uh, they are moved to the waveguide from here. So here uh, you can see uh, again in this diagram, uh, when the electrons are created at the cathode, uh, they are accelerating towards the anode, but because of the magnetic field at the top, instead of going straight, they start spiraling uh, uh, and, uh, and they go spiraling towards the anode. And, when they are spiraling, they are creating the mic, uh, microwave. So um, they are functioning as a high power oscillator and generate pulse of microsecond durations. The frequency is 3000 megahertz. Uh, and um, as I said, when the electrons are uh, generated, they are going in spirals and then creating microwaves. And those microwaves are led to the waveguide through this antenna or these antennas that are in the cavities. Then um, talking about klystron, um, klystron is um, based on like uh, it has an, a cathode and then a, a positive anode. It has um, um, this, the first cavity is called buncher cavity and then uh, it has the second cavity that is called a catcher cavity. So the buncher cavity, um, now remember the um, microwave that was generated in the previous step uh, in modulators uh, they are led into klystron through the buncher cavity and they create a sinusoidal wave uh, so uh, with positive and negative peaks. So when the electrons are generated in klystron, this sinusoidal wave, uh, when the electrons are moving through this field, because of the sinusoidal wave that has positive, positive and negative peaks, the electrons can be accelerated, decelerated, or they stay the same. When they hit, when when they encounter the positive, they are attracted and they are accelerated. And when they encounter the negative peak, they they are decelerated. And when they encounter the area of the sinusoidal wave, which is at zero, they stay at, at the same velocity. So because of these changes in the velocities, we get bunches of electrons instead of a straight stream of electrons. We have bunches as shown here in this picture. You can see that uh, this picture shows bunches of electrons instead of a uniform field of electrons. Um, and that's why this one is called buncher cavity. Then in this drift tube, when the electrons move forward from the buncher cavity and they are accelerated, they create uh, uh, like they um, induce current, uh, a negative current in this. And because of the, uh, in the, in the catcher cavity, they induce a negative current. And because of that induction of that negative current, they are decelerated. Uh, and uh, as a result of that deceleration, microwaves are generated, uh, very high frequency microwaves. And those mi microwaves are then uh, through, um, through this output, they are sent into the waveguide. Here, uh, I have some pictures uh, of the klystrons, uh, some real life pictures. Uh, and again, um, the idea that I discussed is here, uh, they are microwave amplifiers. Uh, electrons are produced by the cathode in the cathode area and are accelerated in the first cavity towards the first cavity that is called the buncher cavity as we discussed. The microwave pulse that was previously generated and led into klystron uh, through here um, has created an alternating current across the cavity here. As a result of this electric field, the velocity of passing electrons is altered. Some are speeded up, some are slowed down, and some have no change. This process is called velocity modulation. This result in bunching of electrons as the velocity mod modulated beam passes through drift tube. 
uh, in the field. And then uh, the electron is passing through this uh, tube, which is called a drift tube. Then um, once the electrons are bunched uh, uh, in the sections of different velocities, these bunches uh, arrive at the catcher cavity and they induce a negative charge. And as a result, they decelerate. The kinetic energy of these electrons is then converted into high power microwaves and these microwaves are fed into waveguide. And waveguide is um, uh, like uh, kept charge free with SF6 gas. So waveguide, um, there are no free electrons in the waveguide and pulse can, uh, a pure microwave can pass through it. Then um, now, if you remember, as we talked from modulator, we send a signal to electrons also, to electron gun also, and then at the same time to klystron. And in the klystron, uh, we magnify the klystron or magnetron, we might mi magnify that microwave and we look at the principle of how the uh, those waves are uh, magnified. They are sent into uh, the main area of the accelerator where the acceleration of electron or positive particles can take place. Here in this picture, um, I have shown a positive particle. So when the particle is between the gap of these um, uh, of these grids, it is the the current to these is assigned. There is an alternating current. So when the particles are in the center of there in this cavity, they will be attracted towards the next one and repelled from the first one. So in this case, we are looking at a positive charge. So when the positive charge comes to the cavity, this one becomes positive and this one becomes negative and it is accelerated. And when the particle enters here, this gets into the same charge. So the particles are confined into the cavity and they don't go out uh, and they don't escape. So this is how the accelerator principle work. We have these, um, um, uh, these grids uh, and uh, there are cavities or gaps between the grids. So between these gaps, our charged particles are accelerating and within these, they are confined uh, uh, into groups and the, uh, we stop them from escaping. Electrons are produced with the help of an electron gun uh, with an initial energy of 50 kilo electron volts. And these electrons are then accelerated in the waveguide. The microwaves produced by magnetron or klystron are led to this section and the electrons emitted from the electron gun are superimposed on these waves. As the electrons are moving, the polarity, the polarity reverses in such a way that they are accelerated while going through gaps and are focused while going through the disks. So when they are going through the disks, they are focused. And when they are going through the gaps, they are accelerated. And this is a picture of electron gun. Um, Electron gun is made of tungsten and it's a tungsten mesh, basically. It's kind of, you can see these lines uh, in here and, and it's kind of a mesh and it's heat, when it's heated, it starts emitting electrons. Uh, and uh, in all these three pictures, uh, uh, we are looking at an electron gun. Then um, the bending magnet, uh, once the electrons are accelerated to the required energy, um, they are bent at different angles. If we have low energy accelerators, they have a small accelerating tube and we can directly have a target at the end of the electrons, uh, at the end of the accelerator length and electrons can be bombarded on the target and uh, X-rays can be produced. So it, it, sometimes it is vertical and those accelerators, uh, they, we don't bend the electrons. And electa bends the electrons at 90 degrees. So um, they kind of move the electron through different bending magnets and then bend them at 90 degrees to, um, to bombard them on the target. And variant accelerators and other accelerators uh, can bend them at 270 degrees. So the electrons, when they come out of the window, uh, they pass through the bending magnet and uh, they take a 270 degree turn, hit the target and then go through primary and secondary collimation. And we will look at these in detail also. So when the electrons emerge from the exit window, they are in a small, uh, they have a very small diameter of about two to three millimeter. In Khan book, um, it says two millimeter, but uh, some books also uh, mention, in the Khan book, it says three millimeters, sorry, but some book also mentioned two millimeters. So I wrote two millimeter here as well. In, 
in some low energy linear accelerators, um, these electrons are allowed to, pr uh, to proceed straight. Uh, as I discussed, they go straight and then hit the target. And in high linear energy, uh, in high accelerator, uh, the electrons can bend on to again uh, bend on a 270 degrees and then hit the target. So this is the schematics of a head. So this is the beam delivery section of the accelerators uh, that I earlier that, uh, we have about. a question in a chat box: Why the discs are not of equal length in which electrons are focused in cholesterol? But so. Yeah, go, going back to these discs. Sorry. Uh, so, so there is some background. Is someone talking or is someone trying to answer? Yeah, yeah. Uh, someone's mic was not muted. I just muted. Oh, okay. <laughs> so the discs are uh, not of equal length because as we are moving forward, the electrons are accelerating. And we, and we need larger and larger disks to, uh, to con confine them. So in the beginning, the acceleration, as I, uh, as I said, they are 50 kilo electron volts. So we need smaller length disks for them to confine them. But as they are going through the gaps, they are accelerating. And because of their acceleration, we need larger and larger disks. So um, as I said earlier, uh, uh, one of the largest accelerators is two miles. So all those two miles are basically these disks of varying and continuously like as we go from step to step, their length will increase. So um, uh, that is a two mile accelerator and, um, and all these disks are, what they are doing is they are accelerating and then confining the electrons. So the more the energy, uh, the velocity of the electron, the, the longer disk we need to confine it. Was that enough? <laughs> Yeah, I think so. It's yeah. You can proceed, please. So, so now, coming back to the beam delivery um, in the accelerator head. So when the electrons are bent on two seventy degrees, or in some cases ninety degrees, they hit the target. So first, we uh, encounter the target in the electron path, and this is the section that I said for those of you who are preparing their exams. Um, uh, please uh, pay special attention to this section because there are questions uh, regarding this section. So when the electrons uh, are bombarded on the X-ray target, um, uh, we, um, these are uh, very high energy electrons. And instead of reflecting X-rays, uh, we get X-rays in the forward direction, uh, transmission X-rays. So when X-rays are produced, then we encounter a primary collimator. Uh, and after primary collimator, um, we have a flattening filter for photons and a scattering foil for electrons. And then we have ionization chamber. And then um, we remember here we had primary collimators and we, then we had secondary collimators. We can have tertiary collimators and excess mount. So um, we are going to discuss th this section in detail one by one. Um, one of the important thing is the position and location of these things in the heads. So if a question come, they may be asking you, um, is the ion chamber before the scattering foil or after the scattering foil uh, and, and things like that. So please remember these things and remember the sequence of them in the head. So um, first of all, um, uh, in, uh, in this block diagram here that I have, when I have this just these different sections, I have copied a section of the block diagram and pasted in that area to see where we are. So here, it's the first section. Uh, we have X-ray target, and the electrons are bent and uh, uh, strikes here on the target. And here, I have the picture of X-ray target. So you may just remember the electron gun picture that we just saw. It's similar, but believe me, uh, <laughs> these are different. These are made of tungsten. Uh, this is not a mesh like electron gun. It's like kind of a solid disc here in, in these uh, areas. So the, when, when this electron pencil beam strikes the target, it produces high energy X-ray beams through brain strollen process. Characteristic, remember characteristic X-rays are very low energy X-rays. So we, um, we are looking at brain strollen uh, process here. 
Uh, and um, this is a German word, so my pronunciation may be wrong. Uh, we we uh, pronounce different things very wrong when they are German. Uh, so we have the another question. The target is what? Uh, uh -huh, the, sure. Yeah, the why the electron beam is two seventy degree but not ninety degree. Uh, we we do have some accelerators do uh, bend at ninety degrees as I discussed. Uh, Electa does it at ninety degrees, um, but at when we are choosing energies, um, we tune the magne bending magnet to a specific energy, and these bending magnets where they are are doing is they only allow a specific energy to turn at 290 uh, at 270 or uh, 90 degrees and then the rest of the electrons that are not in that energy range uh, are just absorbed on the side so um varian has found it 270 degrees to be more optimal and um and electa uh, at one stage was thinking to change to 270 degrees because this gives us better uh, results so um, uh, today, as of today, I don't know if Electa has moved on to 270 degrees or they are still at 90 degrees, but um, two, 270 degrees uh, is more optimal than 90 degrees. But we do have accelerators with 90 degrees. So the target is water cooled as a lot of heat is generated in the process. Uh, uh, and uh, on accelerators, uh, you may have seen that um, we either have chillers or we either have city water to keep the accelerators uh, cooled and uh, one of the cooling is done for the target. It absorbs most of the incident electrons. So the incident electrons that are coming in two millimeter or three millimeter as a pencil beam, they are absorbed here. And uh, an X-ray beam is produced. The X-ray beam is a transmission type as the electrons are incident on one side of the target and the X-rays is produced uh, on the other side. Uh, it's forward peaking. Um, the electron energy is converted into a spectrum of X-rays. So the X-ray beam that is generated is not monoenergetic. It has a lot of different, it's actually a spectrum of um, energies from zero all the way to the max energy of the electrons. Um, uh, and maximum energy is equal to the energy of the incident electrons. So whatever the incident electron energy was, that will be the maximum energy of the X-rays and a rule of thumb, the average energy of this X-ray beam is one third of the um, uh, average energy of the electrons. Uh, one third of the max electron energy. Electron beam is designated MEV because it is almost monoenergetic. So um, this is common when we say we have a six MEV uh, electrons or nine MEV electrons, uh, we call it um, MEV. And when we are talking about X-rays, we say MV, megavolts. Uh, um, so, in because X-ray, it's not monoenergetic; it has a whole spectrum. Uh, so we cannot call the whole spectrum as MeV. Um, so we call it MV because it's heterogeneous, and it is designated uh, by megavolt as if the beam is produced by applying the voltage across X-ray tube. So we imagine um, actually we are not applying any uh, voltage across any tube when we are uh, talking about linear accelerators, but we just imagine that if we had applied a voltage of 6 MV across the X-ray tube, we would get this extra energy. So that's customary, that's just denoting it uh, with this, and it's not actually uh, applying the voltage across the tube. Then electrons for treatment with electron beam, as the electron exit the window of the tube, the beam is, uh, again, the beam is the two, two or three millimeter uh, diameter beam. They are made to strike the electron scattering foil. So instead of a tungsten target, here the electrons uh, strike a scattering foil. Target is removed and the scattering foil is moved in. The scattering foil spreads the beam and help uh, get a uniform fluence across the field. The scattering foils are less lead, lead based uh, uh, and thickness is such that electrons are scattered and do not produce Brandstrahlung. There are still some electrons which are converted to X-ray and they come. Uh, they are our X-ray contamination of our electron beam. So, um, for um, uh, for as an FYI, when you are looking at an ele electron uh, curve, um, the X-ray contamination 
starts two centimeters after the RP, which is the uh, like um, the practical range of electrons. So when you look at a curve, um, when you scan your uh, energy next time, the electrons look at the curve closely, and then it is close to zero. At one point, we have the pra practical range of electrons, and two centimeter after practical range, the amount that we get is the X-ray contamination of your electron beam. For any uh, energy, you can look at that and calculate how much contamination you have. Then, um, then uh, talking about primary collimation, so now, we talked about the X-ray target or electron scattering foil. Then the beam after passing through, uh, if it is X-rays or electrons, it moves through primary collimator. So primary collimator in this image, if you can see, it's kind of a conical shape um, and the beam is passing through this pri primary collimator. So the purpose of primary collimator, it's not a big electronic or anything uh, happening here. It's just uh, like, uh, trying to confine the beam and uh, move it um, towards the next process. It has a conical hole for the beam to pass through. It sets the maximum. So here we are setting the maximum field size and reduce or minimize the scattered radiation that are escaping the machine. So we don't have a lot going here. We are just kind of confining the electron beam uh, to move them to our next step. And they are made of, this is made of a tungsten block. Then um, once they go through the primary uh, collimators, they move to the next step. And if we are talking about photons, photons um, are bombarded on uh, flattening filters. So these flattening filters are conical. So you see they are kind of peak, uh, the cone peak in the center and then gradually uh, goes down towards the sides. Um, these flattening filters um, are used to make the X-rays uniform across the field. Uh, and again, these days, flattening filter free beams are also available and, and we use them. So in case of flattening filter free uh, X-ray beams, we move these flattening filters from the path of the beam and, and the beam just goes straight. It does go through a scattering foil again, but it doesn't go through this flattening filter. Uh, here again, uh, for your, um, uh, like when you do monthly QA and you take uh, your field size image uh, for uh, for those of you who are not taking it for all the X-ray beams, uh, please make sure that you take those field size images for all the X-ray beams because when we are changing X-ray energies and in one of the pictures um, here, you can see that this disk for X-ray energies different, for different energies, um, different flat, uh, filters come in front of the beam. So we have to make sure that the pencil beam is striking straight here at the top of this. Sometimes if they are misaligned our, our beam, uh, at this time it's not pencil, it's scattered, but um, so our beam, the center of our beam is uh, striking here and it's not striking on this area or on this area. If your beam is striking, uh, not hitting the center and it's hitting somewhere else, this will show up on your film and uh, you can talk to engineer and, and they can uh, realign these filters for you. So when your beam is not aligned, your flattening filter may be one of the possible culprits. These filters are made of lead. Uh, other material combinations have also been used like tungsten, uranium, steel, and or aluminum. And um, flattening filters after primary collimators, we have the area of flattening filters. Um, again, talking of flattening filters, as, as I said, uh, for multiple energies, we have multiple flattening filters. So you can see here, um, um, for a two energy accelerator, we have two flattening filters. And when we select one energy, this disk moves and bring this, the filter, uh, the appropriate filter in front of the beam. So we have to make sure that our beam is hitting the center of uh, our so we have a question uh, here. flattening filter. Uh -huh. uh, what's the relationship between uh, FFF and increase in MU? An increase in MU in monitor, monitor unit. units, yeah, or increase in dose rate. Uh, it's uh, increase in MU. Uh, I think like yeah, FFF. Uh -huh. I think they're asking like relationship between yeah. tightening filter beam and why the MU increases. The MU is actually. Uh, do not do not in 
freeze, but when we are talking of flattening filter free beam, uh -huh. yeah, when we are talking of FFF, um, the energy, because here, even when our beam is passing through these uh, flattening filters, the beam uh, is, is a little higher energy, it hardens, and we get, let's say, if we talk about 6 MV, the beam hardens and we get a 6 MV beam when it is passing through the flattening filter. But if we remove the flattening filter, the beam is not hardening. And actually, our 6 MV FFF beam is not an actual 6 MV. It is low in energy. So if you are thinking in that sense, then, then it's this part of our area, the flattening filter, which is causing that. And it's lowering the, uh, it's increasing the energy of a, a regular beam and then the energy of an FFF get decreased because, because the beam does not get hardened. Uh, it doesn't have any uh, flattening filter to pass through. And uh, we will also discuss, uh, um, I have an FFF section uh, in the coming slides uh, and we can discuss that in a little more detail. So in case of the electrons, um, and here you can see we have again some scattering foils. So we get some scattering foils for electrons and uh, flattening filters for X-ray beams. And it's uh, again, uh, we are in this section of our uh, journey. So we have one more question. And then, uh, what's, the, what's the probability sure. of beam not striking the filter pointed region? And what's the possible causes of the misalignment? Okay. So the possible causes are when this disc moves, um, this disc may not go exactly in its place and the beam, instead of uh, hitting the, this very primary point can hit any side. In my experience, like uh, I've been in the field for ages now, <laughs> I started in dinosaur age. Um, I have not seen it happening a lot, uh, but if it, uh, again, in accelerators, um, I've seen some centers when I was in Las Vegas, they were not doing monthly QAs. And when you ask them, why are you not doing monthly QAs? They would say, have you ever seen uh, output change changed? And yes, I have seen output changed. Output does change. <laughs> so if we have to keep it tidy. Um, so it's a good practice to do, to do these tests because if we don't do our tests, we don't know the status of our machine. So these may not change for years, and then suddenly there will be a change, and you should know when that change happened. So um, did that answer your yeah, question? Yeah, I think that the question. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so, yeah, so it rarely happens, like it's not, uh, it can happen weekly or monthly. It rarely happens, but when it happens, uh, we are definitely uh, not giving a uh, uniform radiation and we may be uh, like treating wrong. So then the ion chamber, so now we are, um, we are past the flattening filter and the scattering foil and now we are at the ion chamber of our discussion. So when the beam is coming out of the accelerator, it is very important for the accelerators to uh, monitor the beam when we are treating humans. Uh, and these days, um, uh, like in the United States, um, uh, the animal rights uh, are also a lot. So even when we are treating an animal, uh, uh, sometimes there are experimental animals that uh, people radiate, but then sometimes there are accelerators for animals for the pets. So, uh, uh, and definitely we cannot treat pets wrong, <laughs> but uh, for animals, for experimental animals also, we have to be very careful. So these ion chambers, um, they keep um, uh, like, uh, they, they keep an, you can say keep an eye on the accelerator. After passing through the flattening filter, the beam is then incident on those monitoring chamber. These chambers are usually transmission type. So again, they are transmission type. When, uh, when the beam strikes on one side, it goes through the other side. And these chambers monitor dose rate of the machine, integrated dose that's passing through and field symmetry. So field symmetry is one of the important things. And um, whenever you ask a very engineer that the symmetry and flatness of my machine is out, they try to adjust the field symmetry and flatness uh, gets adjusted with the, uh, by adjusting the symmetry of the machine. And symmetry is something that these uh, ion chambers are monitoring. These are sealed. So if you think 
ion, the, our ion chambers, with the help of which we do our monthly QA, um, they are not sealed. Uh, uh, so we we do uh, incorporate uh, uh, pressure and temperature correction factor in our equation for our final output. But these uh, chambers are sealed, so they are not affected by outside pressure or temperature. And that's why um, like the outside temperature or pressure is not affecting their reading and they can read dose rate, uh, integrated dose, especially the integrated dose part of it. And then symmetry is, symmetry is just like looking at the different parts, but integrated dose um, will depend on temperature and pressure if these were not sealed. And bias voltage to these can be 300 to uh, 1000 volts. And again, these are some more pictures of uh, um, uh, our uh, ion, ion chambers in the head of the accelerator. Um, Farian uses, it's called Kapton ion chamber for the true beam, for true beam accelerators. The Kapton ion chamber is uh, made of two independently sealed volumes with windows and electrodes made of radiation resistant polyamide resin called Kapton. Their sensitivity drift with the passage of time because of oxygen depletion within the chamber. So this is very important, again, for uh, all of you um, to keep an eye on this. If your monthly output has an upward trend, this, uh, and like usually it happens with temperature and pressure also, like uh, one of my machine, uh, it's a true beam machine, we run it on city water, unfortunately. And uh, like I have to adjust the outputs whenever uh, winter comes or summer comes in every change of season, I have to change, uh, adjust my outputs, but that's temperature and pressure dependent. But if you see a continuous upward trend, irrespective of the change in uh, season, then you may get your engineer on a notice because uh, your ion chamber may be going out. When your ion chamber goes out uh, and it is replaced, then you have to do um, all kind of tests, flatness symmetry of your beam, P check PDDs, the energy of your uh, X-rays and electrons, and then also output, the absolute output, um, like some people use TG51, and I think uh, that the, uh, the uh, International Atomic Energy Agency has a protocol that is called TRS398. It is either 397 or 398. Uh, I'm confusing, I'm confusing here. But they, those, when you are using any one of them, expect, uh, expect a 15 to 20% difference in your output once the ion chamber is changed in the linear accelerator head. And that is because when the ion chamber was going out, when the oxygen was getting depleted inside it, there was an, an upward trend and you are adjusting your, um, your output of the machine every two or three months. Uh, and uh, like the machine would show a higher output, you will bring it down. The next month or three months later, the machine will again uh, show a higher output, one, two percent, one or three percent, and you will bring it down. So that upward trend, then uh, suddenly when you change it, now you have a new ion chamber and, and then you have a 15 to 20 percent lower output. Uh, your output can be at 85 percent or 80 percent. So the best thing at this time to do is what I usually do is I do not recalibrate my daily QA or diodes. So I put my water tank, I do my TG51, adjust the outputs, uh, make them 100%, and then double check them with either my daily QA device or diodes. Because daily QA divide and diodes are calibrated to 100. They are not checking your absolute dose. So adjust your output with T, your TG51 or TRS398, and then double check with the daily QA device or um, diodes, and do not change anything in daily QA or diodes. And here are the FFF uh, as we talk uh, again. So the flattening filter, when we have the flattening filter and the beam strikes it, um, we get a completely flat beam. Uh, and uh, this may be a familiar curve to you all. But when we remove this flattening filter, we get this peaked beam. It's kind of a peak. So in the center, we have more radiation and towards the side, we have less radiation. So this peak beam, if we have a small field, like if we are treating SBRT of SRS or SRS, this peak beam give us an advantage that we can increase the dose in the center of our field 
and reduce the do dose in peripheries. So in peripheries, we may be protecting some critical organ. This reduced dose is helpful in protecting critical organ. And this increased dose in the center is helpful in hitting the tumor to the maximum dose. And in SBRT and SRS, hot spots of 20% or more are not only acceptable, but they are desired. Uh, keep them in your GTV, remember that. Um, so this forward peak gives us a hot spot. It helps us to get a hot spot of 20% or more for our SBRT treatment tumors as well. So when we remove the, uh, the um, flattening filter, uh, we get a flattening filter free beam and a flattening filter free beam um, has advantages when we are treating small fields. Do not treat large fields with flattening filter free because then um, you will be, it will be difficult for you to get uniformity across the field. Uh, uh, if the tumor is large, it will be difficult for you to optimize it and get uniformity. Uh, you can still do it, but I mean, it will be time consuming and uh, a lot of a lot more monitoring units. So that was the question earlier. Uh, and the other answer to this is, if you are using larger, if you are treating larger tumors with your uh, FFF beam, then um, you are like trying to treat a, an area, a large area where your beam is not uniform. So in order to get that uniformity, your accelerator has to use MLCs vigorously to get that area covered. And when it is shielding most of the time and treating for a smaller time, you are going to get thousands of MUs. Um, that is one of the reasons you can get more MUs when treating with FFF. The other reason uh, uh, which is apparent is when we are treating very small tumor, we are delivering a very high dose. So uh, like we can, we can for lung SPRT patients, we may be treating 1000 centigrade for five fractions or 1700 for three fractions. And when we are treating such a high dose, then definitely our monitoring units are going to, if you think proportionally, if we have 100, 110 monitoring units for 100 centigrade, it's 10% higher. So for 1000 centigrade, we will have 10% higher monitoring units and those will be 1100 uh, monitoring units. So treating a higher dose gives us higher monitoring units and treating a bigger volume, a larger volume instead of a smaller uh, with our FFF beam will also give you more monetary units. Then we have wedges. Um, uh, let me discuss uh, wedges first. Um, there are three different, of, different type of wedges that you will hear. One is a universal wedge. It's a 60 degree wedge that's, that is built into the head of the accelerator. Electa has universal wedge. So when we are using any other angle, um, the, the electa will use with wedge and without wedge field to compensate for that angle. So you will have either open field or a 60 degree wedge in the field, but using different proportions, uh, it will uh, create a wedge that we want to use. Then we have enhanced uh, dynamic you, wedges. Uh, Those are called we ETWs. In ET uh, last few minutes, uh, you have like okay. uh, seven more minutes, please. Uh, so Okay, so I think, yeah, I'm done these with these were the last slices and MLCs, these, these can be tertiary uh, collimators or uh, um, some accelerators have them uh, in, instead of uh, one of the fixed jaws. So um, those were uh, the details. And uh, if you have any questions. Uh, I, I would like to ask all the participants kindly uh, unmute if you have any questions you can ask. Sorry, please, we still have little time. Let's take the MLC and then. Um, so if you can help us take the MLC and the uh, the wedge part a little bit, for maybe for five, two or five minutes. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, I didn't hear please. you clearly. Yes, sir. Please, we still have a little minute. If you can take us through the wedge and the MLC part, please. Thank you. Yeah, actually, yeah, the wedge was, uh, almost, I was almost done. The enhanced dynamic wedges are like um, variant accelerators, especially two beams, 
they use one of the wide jaw to, and they move it at different speeds across the field to, to create a, a wedge effect. So for, for 60 degrees, it will be a different speed. For 45 degrees, it will be a different speed. And uh, so that will be enhanced dynamic wedge when one of the jaw is moving to create a wedge effect. And universal wedge is a physical 60 degree wedge. And then we have physical wedges uh, which are which usually come in a combination of 15, 30, 45, and 60 degrees. And those are physical wedges that we have uh, in the accelerator room. And we can attach them at the end of the, there is a slot at, uh, in the machines. So if you want to treat with those wedges, we attach them to the end uh, in the slot. So these are three different kind of wedges that you may come across when you are talking about the accelerators. Uh, uh, universal wedges, enhanced dynamic wedges, and physical wedges. And then we have mirror. Mirror just projects the field size uh, of the, um, uh, the field size. There is a light. It reflects the light through our uh, secondary collimators and project it on the patient. And then we have SSD light, which is source to surface distance SSD light. And then MLCs, um, the, the uh, multi-leaf collimators, um, they uh, are like, um, they can, uh, we can use MLCs. Uh, almost all the uh, modern accelerators have MLCs, so we are not using blocks a lot now. Um, uh, and some accelerators can have MLCs as tertiary collimator. Uh, so we have a primary, then we have secondary XY jaws, and then we, will, we might have MLCs. Or some accelerators will replace one of XY jaws and put MLCs instead of them. So MLCs will be uh, MLCs can be secondary or tertiary collimators depending on the accelerator. And then slot for wedges and accessories they come at the end of the accelerator. Uh, we have place for placing wedges and accessories uh, uh, in in those slots. So that's the uh, heads section of the accelerator. Thank you so much for letting me uh, speak today. Uh, Thank you I very really much, appreciate the opportunity. Uh, Thank you, sir. Uh, we, have, uh, we have we have a few more questions, sir. Here, uh, sure. like, what is the relationship between flattening filter and dose per pulse? How the dose rate increases when flattening filters are removed? How the dose rate increase? Um, so we can have higher dose dose rates for our uh, regular beams also. So the dose rate does not uh, only depend on FFF beams, but we can like for FFF beams, we usually treat with a thousand or 1400. Um, the reason for that is we have a lot of monetary units, uh, like monetary units can be in thousands. So we want to go through them quickly. These days um, for regular beams with uh, flattening filter, we have dose rates of 600. Uh, we, we vary and usually provide with 600 top. But that's regulation. That's not the uh, uh, result of any flattening filter or FFF beam, but those are regulations. They don't allow to use any higher dose rates. Okay. Sorry. Hello? Yes. Uh, please, is the iron chamber used as as a, a timer behind to his uh, the to, to the dose? It does not act as a timer, but it like uh, as we discussed, it is looking at uh, symmetry of the beam. So if the symmetry of the beam, it feels like beam is more on one side and beam is less on the other side. It does uh, give an interlock, and it can terminate the uh, the radiation. So um, uh, it acts uh, as like it, it is looking at the dose rate and um, all those things, and then uh, it terminates if the beam is uh, out of tolerance. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh uh, and who is the bitter? Uh, a captain ion chamber that used in uh, true beam or uh, the ion chamber that used in electa? Um, I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, ion chamber can go uh, bad in electa or uh, linear accelerators uh, or variant accelerators. Um, like it usually they can puncture or or they can start losing uh, oxygen in them the pressure of oxygen in them so um, there can be a lot of factors that can affect them 
but which one is better? Uh, I really personally don't know about that. Sorry for that. Okay, okay thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mohammad Risha, for your time and for this insightful lecture. I hope we will see you to, uh, on many more occasions with MPTF. And uh, thank you very much for this lecture. Inshallah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the opportunity, and I really appreciate that. Thank you, sir. You all so have a good before, day. Have a good day. Assalamualaikum. So, uh, before moving to the next lecture, I just like to mention uh, 